not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for your hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Um, before I start, I, um, uh, Ralph and I, we are looking for uh, a few people to help us. Um, uh, Chris Sweeters, that's the name. Sorry. We're going to help him move um, in Waterbury. He moved his stuff to a storage on September 30th. So if you're going to be available that Saturday morning, please see me or Ralph afterwards. I uh, would like to have a few, um, a, few, a few people help us out, okay? So, um, this morning, I, uh, I want to talk about a very important topic. You know, in uh, a few weeks back, three weeks uh, to be exact, as a matter of fact, I remember Derek was the one who did scripture reading for me. You know, I want to talk about uh, not so much Christian apologetics, but I want to say a few things about that. You know, um, last time I talked about the importance of sound doctrines. You know, so it's, it's kind of the same thing, but I like to build on that. You know, and whenever we say the word apologetics, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, it's apology. You know, Christian apologetics, it's not about giving a mere apology for your faith. That's not what it's about, really. It's not about saying I'm sorry because you believe in Christ. In fact, don't you ever apologize to anybody for your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't you ever apologize to anybody for believing that there is a God somewhere who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. And one day Jesus is going to come back to take his people home. Don't you ever apologize for that? Because that is what we believe as a church body. As a matter of fact, if you ask me... There are folks out there teaching things like evolution and nonsense about human beings evolving from animals. They should be the one apologizing for what they believe. I don't know about them, but when I look at myself, I believe that God created me. He, he created all 210 pounds of me. He created me black and beautiful, and I love it. God is my creator. Though nobody can tell me otherwise. I don't want to apologize for that. When I woke up this morning, I put my clothes on. I look at myself in the mirror. I said, self. Self said, hmm. I said, you look good this morning. <laughs> yes, I do. I look good and I'm beautiful. Some of you might be thinking, oh, he's narcissistic. Uh, no, I'm not. The Bible says you are beautifully and wonderfully made. So if you want to blame somebody, blame the Bible, because I believe what the Bible says about me. So I am beautiful. Maybe some of you might be thinking, well, what, what about his family? Well, you know, you, you may not think I'm beautiful. It's all right. Guess what? As long as my wife thinks I'm beautiful, my mom thinks I'm beautiful, that's all the beautiful that I need. The idea here is that there are certain things that the world is teaching. I believe they need to apologize for that. Brothers and sisters, Christian apologetics, it's not about saying I'm sorry. It's about the defense of the gospel. It's about defending what you believe. It's about giving a reasonable argument and biblical evidences for what it is you believe and why you believe what you believe. My question for you this morning is, do you know what you believe? Because sometimes you can be sitting here and, and it's all good, but do you know what it is that you believe in this congregation? And can you make a reasonable argument, use Bible, and give evidences? This is why I believe we take the Lord's Supper on a Sunday morning. This is why I believe you must be baptized to be saved. This is why I do not believe in premillennialism. Can you back up what you believe? Because these things are very important. Now, there are some of us here who are newborn Christians. And I can understand that you haven't grown enough to know all these things. But those of us who are grown up Christians, those of us who have been Christians for the last 10, 15, 20 years, I believe you need to be able to 
give an apology, give a defense for the things that you believe? Can you give a reason for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus? First of all, I want to point out this phrase from the text. Look what it says. Everyone who asks you for a reason. Everyone. You know, I found that very interesting because before you can defend the gospel, people need to see the gospel in you so that they can ask you about it. Before you can talk about your faith, people need to see your faith in action before you can talk about it. They need to see you practice what you preach. They need to see you loving one another, serving each other, standing firm on the doctrines and the teachings of the gospel. Not dibble-dabble with whatever someone says. Because you have a lack of faith, a lack of knowledge in scripture. They need to see you hopeful and joyful about being in Christ. The world needs to see that so that it can spark some interest and have a conversation with them about it. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be so busy conforming ourselves to the world, living according to their ideologies and standards, and yet expect them to be able to see Christ in us. There has to be a difference. In fact, after making that statement in 1 Peter chapter 3, later Peter says in the next chapter, chapter 4, Peter says, they are surprised that you do not do the same thing they do. Peter says, when you are in Christ Jesus, people in the world are going to think it's strange that you do not live like they do. You do not party like they do. They think it's weird that you'd rather be here on a Sunday morning worshiping God instead of staying at home waiting for the saints to be the patriots again. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. Anytime they lose, I'm a happy man. I'm sorry, I'm getting myself in trouble. I'm sorry. You know, they think it's strange that you do not do the same thing they do. But you're here. But the question remains, are you capable? Are you spiritually minded enough? Are you knowledge enough about scripture? Are you faithful enough to give a defense and confirmation of the gospel? I said both defense and confirmation because when you read Philippians chapter 1, Paul was addressing the church in Philippi, and Paul says, to them, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You see, the idea of defending the gospel, it's not only about giving the reasonable arguments and biblical evidences for what you believe, but it's also about giving an opportunity for other people to respond to the gospel. Which is why Peter said, in your defense of the gospel, make sure that you do it gently and with respect. Defending the gospel is not about telling people how bad they are. You can't be rude while you're preaching the gospel. We need to do it respectfully and with gentleness in our heart. During my prepare, uh, during, while I was getting ready for this lesson, I bought a book from, from Jim Crisp. His office is right next to mine. He has more books than I do. This book, actually I bought several books from him. But this one caught my attention. It's called Dawn of Belief. It's written by this guy named Roger Dixon. In this book, he made a statement, simple but yet interesting. Listen to what he says. Everyone believes something. That something which is believed is generally believed because, one's ha one, because one has been convinced of it by some type of evidence. We can also give some sort of defense for believing what we believe. All normal thinking people have beliefs and defenses for those beliefs. It is no different with Christianity. It's not a defenseless religion. But since there are historical evidences, there are scientific, archaeological evidences out there that can back up our faith as disciples of Christ. By the way, if you want to know a little bit more, there's this new documentary out. I watched it on Netflix, and I think uh, Derek showed it to the teens. It's called Is Genesis History. It's a, it's a good documentary to watch, especially watch it with your kids, because they are being taught a lot of things out there in the world. 
In this, in this documentary, they are like a bunch of scientists and smart people with college degrees I did not even know existed talking about creation and the existence of God. We're not talking about typical Christians. We're talking about people with college degrees, PhDs, and other stuff. Talking about that. So there are evidences out there. Or maybe there's this new movie out I want to share with you as well. It's called The Case for Christ. It's written by this guy. It's based on a book written by Lee Strubble, who was a journalist. And I think Jim may have mentioned that here before. Lee Strubble was a journalist who did not believe in God. His wife found Jesus, and his wife told him about Jesus. So he decided to put his journalistic you know, instinct uh, at work, saying, I'm going to investigate Christ and prove you wrong. In the process of investigating Christ, he ended up having so much evidence about the existence of Christ that he wrote the case for Christ, the case for faith, the case for God. There are plenty of evidences out there that can back up what we believe. However, like Roger Dixon said in his book, how about something like this? The reason why I'm showing you this, I want you to understand we know what we believe. Many of you can give me plenty of reasons as to why Democrats are better than Republicans. Some of you can tell me why Republicans are better than Democrats. Some of you read books about it. Some of you watch the news. And some of you have a lot of different arguments. You can make convincing arguments as to why your belief is better than the other person. I'm not bringing this up to spark some political debate or to argue which one is better. I'm just saying I know some of you are Democrats. I know some of you are Republicans. And I've seen you argue about it. Maybe uh, there are other things we can argue and we can bring evidence about. How about these two teams? Some of you will say, oh, the Giants are way better than the Patriots. Where are my Giants fan in the room? Some of you will say the Patriots fan are way better than the Giants. Okay, we know who the preacher is supporting. Now, listen, the idea here is that you can say, oh, Tom Brady has five uh, uh, Super Bowl and, and, and Eli Manning only have two. And you know all these facts. And you can argue all day and all night because you truly believe and you're passionate about your football team. And you can give evidences as to why you believe this team is better than the other one. For me, here's where you get me. Many of you don't know who this guy is. But if you ask Ethan Sinzone, Ethan Sinzone will tell you Messi is better than Ronaldo. He can tell you that because there are plenty of evidences proving that this player is better than the other one. And guess what? I can argue all day about it because I know all these facts. I love soccer a lot. Now, the reason why I'm putting all these things out is because I want you to understand that I believe your readiness to defend and present the gospel is only as strong as your passion and your faith in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Your readiness to teach or share the gospel with somebody else is only as strong as your passion and your faith in Jesus Christ. You see, I believe when you truly believe in something, when you're really passionate about something, People don't need to force it out of you. People don't need to bother you about it. They don't need to ask you about it. People are going to see it in your behavior. They are going to see it on your Facebook page. They are going to see it on the bumper staker. You are always going to talk about it. As a matter of fact, if I ask the teens, who is Preston's Hazard's favorite singer? They all can tell you. Can somebody tell me? Jim Morrison. You know why? Because he talks about him all the time. He listens to this guy all the time. I didn't even know who he is. I had to go and Google it for myself. Because he's passionate about it. When you're passionate about something, when you really believe in something, you will learn about it, you'll argue about it, you'll make, a, you, you, you'll make an argument for it because you believe it's better. You believe this thing is a good thing. I remember some of you, one person particularly came to me and asked me, well, why is it that you're always talking about your wife when, when you preach? Why is it that you're always mentioning Rose? 
Uh, I'm in love with her. Do you want me to talk about another woman? Who else am I supposed to talk about? I spend seven days a week with her. I get a lot of stories to talk about. I have no choice but talk about her because she's a woman in my life, the mother of my kids. So yes, I'm going to talk about her every Sunday I'm preaching. I am. And guess what? I'm ready to fight for her as well. I'm ready to defend her honor. I'll fight any one of you for her. I'll fight anybody for her. Well, not anybody, you know. Depends on how big the person is because I don't want to die or anything. Wait, is she here? Oh, I love you, babe. You know I love you. <laughs> the idea here is that when you really love something, when you're really passionate about something, you will defend it. You will protect it. Brothers and sisters, how passionate are you about your faith in Jesus? How passionate are you about the church? How passionate are you about praising God? Because if you are passionate about your faith, it is your responsibility to protect it. It is your responsibility to protect the gospel. In the church, there are those who believe the defense of the gospel is reserved for a selected few. But the Bible teaches us otherwise. We need to defend the gospel because we are entrusted with the gospel. We are entrusted with the gospel. You see, to be entrusted with the gospel, I believe it means that you are assigned with the responsibility to care and protect the truth of the word of God. All of you, once you accept Jesus Christ through water of baptism, you have a responsibility to protect the truth of the gospel. When you are in Christ Jesus, you have that assignment. You have that responsibility to protect the gospel against false teachers, against deceivers, against anyone who wants to pervert the truth of the gospel. Here you go. The Bible says in Jude chapter 1, verse number 3, Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, we all have in common. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all to all his holy people. When you accept Jesus Christ, you are part of that holy people Jude is talking about. And if you are God's holy people, it is your duty, it is your responsibility to protect and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, there's a reason why Jude said that in the book of Jude. If you look at verse 4, he said, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into the church, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. That's what some people were teaching back then. Guess what? I'm still hearing this same lie today. Oh, God is gracious. We can keep on sinning. God is so good. He's going to forgive me anyway so I can go ahead and party on Saturday and go to church on Sunday morning and God is going to forgive me. That is a lie. Jew said, God's grace is not a green card for you to keep on living in sin. God's grace is not a blank check for you to do whatever you want. Some even believe that they can be baptized, become a Christian and keep living in sin. God will forgive me. But the Bible says God's grace is not an excuse for you to live in sin. The Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? Certainly not. Because when you accept the grace of God through water of baptism, you accept his son, Jesus Christ, Paul says the grace of God will empower you to be a better person. It will empower you to live a better life. It will empower you to be different. There are people out there who are trying to pervert the truth 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, verse number 6 and 7, and this thing is not working. Paul says, some people are trying to pervert the truth of the gospel. You see, that word pervert, it means to alter from its original purpose or meaning. Don't you think people are trying to do that out there? There are plenty of people, false teachers, false, false preachers, false prophets, even I would dare say the government, trying to alter the truth of the gospel. What do I mean by that? Well, when the sacred institution of marriage is being redefined by the laws in this country, that is a perversion of the gospel. When Christians are more worried about being politically correct instead of calling sin for what it is, that is a perversion of the gospel. When our school system is teaching our kids about evolution instead of creation, that is a perversion of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, somebody needs to stand up and defend the truth of God's word. But we need to do so gently, respectfully, lovingly, and with a forgiving heart. To defend the gospel, you need to know the teachings of the gospel. How are you going to defend something if you don't know anything about it? Because if you don't know what it is that you believe, and you don't know why you believe what you believe, anyone can persuade you to believe something else. Being able to defend the gospel, it's a matter of spiritual maturity. Jim and I, we've been talking about this here a lot recently because it's important. The fact that you can stand up and, and defend what you believe, it shows that you are a spiritually mature person. We said that Christian apologetics seek to answer two questions. What do you believe and why do you believe what you believe? You know, a lot of us here, we believe, uh, we can talk about the things that we believe in the church. A lot of us know that we worship on Sunday morning. We take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. We believe Jesus Christ is Lord and he's going to come back. But can you defend those beliefs? That is very important. Can you make a reasonable argument and provide biblical evidences as to why you believe the things that you believe? Can you defend your faith when someone is trying to teach you premillennialism. If you can't, go back and watch those classes Jim did a few weeks back on that. These are important, these are important things for the church to know. According to a survey conducted by the Barna, Re Barna Research Institute, a vast majority of young Christians, we already know this, um, they deviate from their faith when they go in college. And the reasons why, one of the reasons why, it's because they cannot defend their faith. It's due to a lack of spiritual maturity. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12 to 14, we read this verse in the teen class earlier. The Bible says, here are some signs of spiritual maturity. If you are a spiritually mature person, you need to be able to handle tough doctrines. Not just saying, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I'm not saying that's wrong to say, but I'm saying sometimes in your life, in your spiritual journey, you got to be able to talk about tough doctrines. The Bible says you need to be skilled in the word of God. You need to be able to discern good from evil, able to teach somebody. Not sitting here needing someone to teach you all the time, but you growing up in your faith and you can teach somebody else. These are signs of spiritual maturity. And only spiritually mature people can actually defend the faith and the truth of the gospel. What a better church, if we are not spiritually mature, if we are not able to teach, rebuke, exhort false teachers, something bad is going to happen. Our faith will be vulnerable to the schemes of the devil. We do not only need to protect the gospel from false teachers, we also need to protect the gospel from false accusations. False accusations. You see, the Apostle Paul, 
is probably the most prominent defender of the gospel that we have in the New Testament. Several times throughout the book of Acts, Paul had to defend his faith because there were false accusations against him. If you want to know about the history of the church and the works that the apostles did, read the book of Acts. If you want to know about the defense of Paul against uh, all these people, I encourage you to read those passages. I'm going to read... I'm going to leave this up there for a few minutes just so you can write it down. I wish I had more time to talk about all these verses. Paul had to defend his faith against the Jewish mob. He had to defend his faith against the Sanhedrin council, the Roman governor Felix and Festus, and finally Agrippa. You can start from chapter 21 all the way to chapter 26 and 27 if you want to learn how to defend your own faith Paul did a great job with that. And fortunate, fortunately and unfortunately for us, nowadays we do not have the same false accusations that, well, not all of them, that were brought up against the first century Christians. However, some of these accusations are still around today. In the first century, many people, especially the Sadducees, would argue, would argue that Christ did not raise from the dead. So the apostle had to defend their faith against that. Can you imagine if people could prove that Christ did not raise from the dead? The resurrection of Christ, it's the foundation of Christianity. If you take that away, everything will, will come crumbling down. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Christ did not raise from the dead, our faith is in vain. Our preaching is in vain. Everything is in vain. There's, there's no reason for you to be here. So they had to stand up and defend the truth of the gospel. They had to provide biblical evidences and reasonable arguments to show that Christ, in fact, rose from the dead. Not only that, another false accusation they had to deal with. And, and I don't think we, we have that today. In first and second century, Christians had to deal with the fact that some people were accusing them of cannibalism. If you don't know where that comes from, it's because in John chapter 6, I believe, verse 51 or 56, it says, Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Some people at that time will say, oh, a bunch of people eating people up in here. So Christians had to stand up against that. The only thing today I think that, came rem that can come remotely close to that teachings, there's something called transubstantiation. Anyone knows what that is? Transubstantiation, it's a Roman Catholic teaching saying that the substance of the Lord's Supper transform into literal flesh and blood once you take it. I don't know about you, when I took the Lord's Supper this morning, it's still bread and juice, that's all it is. It's a metaphor. Jesus Christ said, every time you take this, remember me. Jesus Christ didn't say, once you take it, it's going to transform into flesh and blood in your mouth. The Bible doesn't say that. So yes, there, was, there were people back then who were accusing the church of cannibalism. So they had to defend their faith from that. Brothers and sisters, there are false accusations against the church today. For example, nowadays there's this false idea that church folks are hate-filled bigots. I believe that's a false accusation. However, we need to make sure we behave in a certain way that is not going to get them the ammunition they need to say that about us. For example, I remember when I was working in Hartford, I was in the Weathersfield area, and I believe there's a parenthood clinic or abortion clinic out there and I saw a bunch of Christians I believe God fearing people with their cards and they were screaming you know you are gonna go to hell burn 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 and you know and this that, that, that's not Christianity it's not our job to condemn people to hell it's our job to share the gospel with them and tell them there is a better way Jesus died for you he loves you he wants you in heaven with him we don't need to give them more ammunition. Or another thing that I think we, we, we talk about nowadays or people in the world, they said we are intolerant. Guess what? 
I am intolerant of anything sinful. But I am tolerant of anybody. I will not tolerate sin, not only for anyone, but for myself. I'm a sinful person myself. But we need to love everybody. We must keep that in mind. Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whenever we are defending the faith or sharing the gospel with somebody else, we need to remember, you are a sinner yourself. You are no better than that person you are preaching to or teaching. The only difference between us and the world is that we have Christ and they don't. That's it. That's the only difference. Anyway, so in the book of Acts, chapter 26, Paul was defending his faith in front of King Agrippa. Part of his defense was, Paul is he is beautiful. Paul, Paul is such an intelligent person as, as far as how he approached people, how he talked to them. I would really encourage you to read those passages. So see how Paul talked to a king and, and a governor. You know, so in Acts chapter 26, part of his defense was him sharing the story of his conversion. That, that, sometimes that's all he did. Paul wanted them to know who he was before he met the Lord and who he is after he met Christ. Because Jesus turned his life around. Jesus turned his situation around. Jesus changed his life from being a persecutor to being a preacher of the gospel. He was blind on the road to Damascus, but now he can see. It's about letting people know who you were before Christ and who you are now after you've met Christ. But now that I've been baptized in Jesus Christ, I can testify of the goodness of the Lord. I can testify of his mercy. I can testify of his grace. So y'all can go ahead and say whatever you want to say about me. But when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you stand firm on Jesus, I encourage you to study the word of God and defend your faith and share the gospel with other people. You know, the beautiful thing in Acts chapter 26, after Paul preached the gospel and shared his conversion with, with not only Festus, um, but also King Agrippa and everybody who was there, there's this amazing verse. I want you to see what Governor uh, uh, Festus said. Governor Festus said, Paul, you must be crazy. Much learning has driven you mad. And Paul says, no, I'm not crazy. I'm just preaching the gospel. I'm not crazy. I, I, I'm just a believer in Christ. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm just praising God. There's nothing wrong with me. I, I just want you to understand how much God loves you and wants you to be saved. Festus said, you must be crazy. Has anyone ever called you crazy? Paul, Paul said, no, I'm not. I just want you to know about the hope and eternal life in Jesus Christ. And the beautiful thing about this, after Paul's response to Governor Festus, King Agrippa said in the following verse, you all must persuade me to become a Christian. You all must persuade me. You know, every time that Jim and I, we standing up here and preach, I feel like we almost persuade some of you to do better. But guess what? We don't want to almost persuade you. And Paul answered, just like Paul answered, Paul said, not only almost, but all together, I want you to be like me. There's no such thing as almost. I almost made the decision. When Jesus Christ comes back, you go, oh, man, I, I was that close, Jesus. I it's not going to matter. You either are or you're not. It's not going to matter. Paul says, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today, that's my wish today, all of you who are listening to me today become both almost and all together as I am, a saved person by the grace of God through Christ Jesus. That's what I'd like to see in this church. And that's why we need to share with everybody else. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is free of charge. But you need to accept it. As I'm closing, I was, um, I'm reading this book called uh, The Judas Complex. 
And this writer is a priest, actually. He shared a story. I verified the story, and it's actually a true story. In 1829, there was a man by the name of George Wilson in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you guys ever heard this story, but it's really cool. He had a partner whose name was James Porter. They both attacked a U.S. mailman and killed him. James Porter died, and the other person, he was on his death row. He had some influential people in his life. So those influential people in the life of George Wilson, they went to the president at the time who was Andrew Wilson. And the Bible says, um, the Bible, I mean, not the Bible, the story says as they were, as they went to the president, Andrew, I mean, Andrew Jackson, I'm sorry. When they went to the president, Andrew Jackson, they convinced Andrew Jackson to write a pardon for George Wilson. So Andrew Jackson wrote the pardon and signed it. So they went to the prison and they handed it to the warden and said, okay, this man is free to go. Here's a pardon signed by President Andrew Jackson. So they went to George Wilson and they said, George Wilson, we have a letter from the president. You're free to go. You know what he said? Oh, I can't stand Andrew Jackson. I'm not going to take anything from him. Everyone's surprised. Do you want to die? Here's a free pardon. You can just walk out of the prison right now. But he refused to accept the pardon because he can't stand the president. So the whole thing went to the Supreme Court. And at that time, I believe it was Chief John Marshall, the Supreme Justice. And he wrote, a pardon is an act of grace, proceeding from the power entrusted with execution of the law, which exempts the individual on whom it is bestowed. From the punishment the law inflicts for a crime he has committed. A pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential. And delivery is not completed without acceptance. It may be then rejected by the person to whom it is tendered. And if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in a court to force it on him. Chief Justice John Marshall concluded, A pardon is a piece of paper, the value of which depends upon its acceptance by the person implicated. It is hardly to be supposed that a person under the sense of death would refuse to accept a pardon. But if it is refused, it is no pardon. Therefore, George Wilson must be hanged. Guess what? They hang him, and he died. So the story, the, what's so amazing about this story, when I read it, I'm like, guess what? You are George Wilson. I am George Wilson. God signed a pardon with his son, Jesus Christ. You got to understand what I'm talking about? But you need to accept it for you to be saved. You need to accept that pardon in the water of baptism for you to be saved. Yes, God's grace is for everybody. Yes, we all deserve to die because the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. But you will not be saved if you do not accept that pardon that Jesus Christ signed for us on the cross through water of baptism. It doesn't matter if you don't accept it. You need to accept it this morning. Brothers and sisters, the sermon is yours. What are you waiting for? In Acts chapter 23, um, when Acts 22, when, when Paul was with, uh, um, when Paul at that time saw after he was blind, the prophet Ananias said, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Brothers and sisters, this morning, I hope and pray that some of you are not only, you're not almost persuaded to become a Christian, but you really want to follow Jesus. If that is your desire, I beg of you, come forward. Let's talk about it. If you need to repent from your sin, ask the elders to pray for you. I'm pretty sure they'll be more than happy to do that. And if there are some of you sitting here who haven't accepted that pardon, it won't matter when Jesus Christ comes back. Because if you don't accept the pardon, if you don't accept the pardon today, well, you're going to be on the wrong side of that judgment day. Let's all stand and sing together.